Welcome everyone to episode 113 of the New Gen Mindset Podcast. I'm Dan Kozell here with Nick Tartaglia. Nick, Canada is just a a mess right now. Um, My God, the movement we saw yesterday, the, the social effect from Canadians with that new budget plan for Canada. Uh, I, 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 my phone was blowing up yesterday and that would be an understatement because I had people calling me, asking me what this actually meant and, you know, just getting a first glance at it. Um, it's a bit frustrating because a lot of people have spent a lot of time building their nest egg. Um, that doesn't happen overnight. And now the ones who have done very well are going to get penalized just for you know, trying to sell assets on a capital gains tax. So Correct. if you're hearing this for the first time, I mean, capital gains tax in Canada on deemed dispositions after June 25th of this year are going to get taxed at 66% as opposed to 50%. So uh, for anything above a quarter of a million, basically, but it's ridiculous because you could, ha what happens when you're a pensioner, you're selling your, like you're 60, you did, you've been doing this for 40, 50 years. And all of a sudden here you are taking more than half of my gains for what to give it back to the most incompetent institution that in Canadian history. <laughs> and this, this is coming on the heels of gold hitting an all time high Yeah, silver potentially breaking out to $34 an ounce. Uh, treasuries are rising. Yields are going up. Inflation is out of control. So like how much more of this are people going to take before people start right. migrating to other parts of the world? Mm -hmm. So, and then put it, that puts into context with that other chart we saw floating around where you had, you were looking at employment, or the productive market relative to uh, public employment, private employment, and then uh, individually or self-employed. And you saw self-employment, or you would more classify entrepreneurship in that category, is net negative. They're leaving Canada, you know? And the private sector is slightly going up, and then you have the public sector just boosting away because the government is just inflating the strong employment and the GDP by their own spending and their own, you know, just confiscating our money and just spending it the way they want. And here they're calling that strength. It doesn't seem very sustainable. Yeah, and they're use they could they're going to continue to use that metric, unfortunately, as they have for for decades. Um, but you know, amidst all this kind of banana chaos that we're seeing, um, we actually wanted to bring a guest on here today to really talk about more in depth as to what's going on. Um, because he's got a wealth of experience. Um, and you know, he's got probably I think twenty plus years of experience as a general counsel, uh, and later the CIO of a highly capitalized single family office. Um, he's also a partner at Von Greyers, which is based in Zurich, if I'm not mistaken, and the board member board member of signalsmatter.com. Um, and he's seen a lot of market cycles in his time, touched a lot of asset classes as well. And he's also written a book called Gold Matters, um, which was published, I believe, in 2022. But uh, welcome to the New Gen Mindset Podcast, Matthew Pippenberg. Oh, it's great to be here with you guys. I'm looking forward to swapping thoughts. A lot on your minds, a lot on all our minds right now. Of course. So just to yeah. also say, there's also the book, right? There's two books that you wrote, right? Gold Matters and Rig to Fail, correct? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So obviously, as I said at the beginning, when we were talking, you know, the first thing we like to do is kind of get the backstory of a guest, you know, just tell us about your journey, you know, how you fell into the finance world, you know, how you moved out of Wall Street mm -hmm. and the journey, you know, how you are, where you got to now. Yeah, I was always described as an accidental tourist in Wall Street. You know, my my very best friend from high school and college was from a very wealthy family, and he was an investment banker right out of college. And I went to law school, took the bar exam, and I practiced law for about 20 seconds. And he gave me a call and said, let's start a hedge fund. And this was in the late 90s when a lot of 20-somethings were going out to San Francisco and taking the money of friends, family, and fools and investing in the dot-com bubble and the IPOs of the late 90s. And we were those guys that everyone loved to hate. We got really lucky on an IPO, basically the equivalent then in the late 90s of being someone who bought Bitcoin early, basically. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was a name on the NASDAQ that we did no due diligence on. <laughs> uh, Goldman Sachs was underwriting a pre-IPO. We bought it for pennies a share. It went to hundreds of dollars a share and we bought lots of pennies. And so in our late twenties, <laughs> two very annoying lucky punks uh, were suddenly uh, NASDAQ lottery ticket winners. And and I was joking with my wife when that started, I was leaving this beautiful job at a beautiful law firm after a, a lot of studies. And suddenly I'm a hedge fund manager. At the time I was in my late twenties, I barely knew a stock from a bond. We didn't earn that money. Of course, it was a pure lottery ticket. 
as a metaphor of bubbles, that same stock, which we got out of after restriction was worth nothing about five years later. It was just a typical dot com, you know, joke. But long story short, it did give us the very high class problem of then being responsible for money we didn't really deserve. Uh, his family was already pretty wealthy. That's how we started a family office with him. And then I merged into a multifamily office and was a managing director. So we get combined assets of a lot of money. And that gave me my real education. I say I was a hedge fund manager. I did learn to trade during that period. I did learn what it's like to talk to brokers and look at you know, technicals and fundamentals. But I really got my education as an allocator to other hedge funds, uh, hundreds of other funds we've looked at. When you have lots of AUM and a multifamily office, everyone takes your call. You get to talk to the best and the brightest and the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So my real education was post.com bubble. Uh, and real education was sitting down with some pretty pretty much the whole spectrum from all over the world, Chicago to London to New York, of course, uh, hedge funds, private equity, secondaries, all that stuff. But it got me what I call a good BS detector in Hemingway's you know, vernacular. I, you know, You got a chance to really get educated from smarter people. And from the not so smart people, you, you're on the buy side now and you get to see all the sales pitches. And it really forced me in the last 20 years since then to become my own central banker, my own analyst, my own general counsel, my own CIO. And during that period, again, during that period of looking at risk assets, mostly stocks and bonds and alternative investment vehicles, I had to start thinking about what, what really is money? What is a Canadian dollar, a US dollar, an Australian dollar, a euro? a pound, a peso, uh, when it's fiat, when it's not backed by anything? And what are the risks of measuring your wealth in fiat money? And then I started to think about gold and I started looking at investing in gold. And it was really a game changer for me. It doesn't mean I'm uh, not interested or, or skeptical of risk assets or what can be done in risk assets and how you can trade to your advantage. Very few people do it well. It's very dangerous. Uh, there's a lot of macro and micro risks. But notwithstanding that whole other universe of stocks and bonds and yields and treasuries and central bank policies, I had to just think, what is $100? What is a million dollars? What is $10? And what happens to the purchasing power of that currency and that nation as it goes deeper into debt? And what happens to all the forces around that, which we're seeing playing out now? But to your question, I, I went from a risk asset guy to a precious metals guy by default, but by common sense. And so I do think at this point, gosh, so many years later, because that was the late 90s, and uh, so many years later, I do think of myself now as someone at least versed in in markets and macroeconomics and precious metals and in currencies and in rates. So all of that is, is connected. Um, but long story short, a lucky punk out of law school, got lucky on a lottery ticket on the NASDAQ during a great bubble of 2000, 98, 2000, got out of that in time by pretty much pure luck. And then, um, you know, since then I've gone really to look more at not just how to make money, but how to preserve money. Because one of the lessons I learned mm -hmm. from myself and other families is, is a big joke that if you really want to learn how to manage a small fortune, start with a large fortune. Because the, the real risks to me are drawdowns and macro risks and currency risks. And so, yeah, lawyer, lucky hedge fund manager, family office guy, now precious metals executive in Switzerland. And, uh, um, you know, I, I grew up in the U.S., not far from the Canadian border uh, near near Windsor, uh, spent a lot of time in both countries. But, you know, I have a European-American family and my children are French. My wife is French. So, you know, I've, I've lived in two continents. I, I understand these languages. I have a German father. So between Europe and the U.S. and Canada and then just traveling throughout Asia and Africa and in the Middle East and certainly here in Europe, I get to hear a lot of views and as listening to you guys talk before we went live, mm -hmm. what you're frustrated with in Canada, are the same questions in Johannesburg and Zurich and London and Charleston, South Carolina and Toledo, Ohio. It's really an interesting time. There's always stuff to talk about in there. I when, love how you went from like techie bro to <laughs> precious metals, like yeah. expert, because yeah. that's <laughs> such a unique path, but Nick, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> no, but it was, I was, what I'm curious about really is the, um, how was that journey or the process by which you realized that I needed to focus on preservation because obviously preserving wealth, isn't it like, you know, a lot of the people we talk to and it's something that we've realized ourselves through, you know, making money quick and then losing it. It, it seems that money, making money is one thing, but preserving is a whole other ball game. 
Yeah, no, and believe me, it's a. I, as I say this, I know what the audience, I mean, their eyes are rolling. It's a real high class problem. And not everybody gets that problem when you luck into the kind of money I did in my late 20s in my partner. And don't cry me a river. I mean, when you look at your ATM receipt and it's suddenly bigger than it was a year ago because of nothing that you did. Um, of course, that's a great problem to have. And not everyone has that problem. They have bigger problems. And yet it is a responsibility because believe me, I wasn't, we weren't that smart. We did some stupid things. We invested in Hollywood and sailboats and real estate in California. You know, we weren't so smart, but I was always the legal guy in my mind was where can this go wrong? That's the way we think. It's like in that movie, the big short, where are you screwing me? Where am I going to get screwed? I always thought like that. And frankly, I didn't have the courage to even get into that IPO. If my partner hadn't have done it, we wouldn't even gotten that. So I wasn't a risk taker, but once I lucked into a little bit of extra money for my age, which was more than my parents and grandparents made collectively compounded in a year. Of course, I took it seriously. Mm -hmm. But again, I know that many people out there are just trying to get through the month. So my problem isn't a big problem when I'm 28, 29, dealing with that kind of money. But it was, we did lose lots of money too. We did make bad investments. We did hear from a lot of salesmen that weren't fiduciaries, whether they were at Goldman Sachs or in Hollywood or a yacht broker. And again, that sounds like a wanker thing to say, but when you have a little money, there's a bullseye on you and you make a lot of mistakes. But I was always very cynical and skeptical by nature. That's why I was a lawyer, not an investment banker like my partner. But I was always looking for ways to, that we were going to lose, not how we were going to win. My partner was the eternal optimist. I was the eternal cynic. I think that was a good mix because I ended up thinking more about, okay, whatever dollars I have, how do I protect it for my children and their children? And do I want to speculate? Of course, speculation is what made us the money to take the risk that then to preserve the money. But there is a fine line between the sublime and the ridiculous. Yeah. And whether you have a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, you've got to preserve risk. You've got to preserve your capital. You've got to take some risk, of course. But, and, and we can talk about, there's not a lot of room for upside right now in the world and in the markets, whether they're, you know, risk assets, you know, of course there's crypto. That's another discussion. It's important, but there is a lot of places you can get burned right now. And I always thought of, even in my 30s, when I was doing stupid things everywhere in the compass, wherever the map would take me in my personal life, my financial life, just being a young, my dad said I was like a rock star without the paparazzi, just acting <laughs> like a punk. But there was a little part of me that said, man, I, I got to think, what is this dollar worth in 20 years? What, Where can I preserve a chunk of my my wealth. And again, whether you have a large amount of money or, or very little amount of money, you still have to preserve. And, and the problem today is in Canada, I was in Vancouver in January talking to a lot of angry Canadians. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been again, I've been in South Africa, I've been in London, I've been in Switzerland, Germany and France already this year. I'm heading to Singapore next week. Everyone's upset. Everyone wants to leave to go somewhere else. Even the Swiss are asking about South America. It's mm. there is no grass is greener. But when I'm talking to people with high incomes, I'm talking to Uber drivers and, and the same kind of cynicism and distrust is everywhere. And again, I want to be sensitive because there are people trying to get through the month, pay rent, yeah. real, real problems, not Matt, how do you preserve money you want in a lottery ticket? But yet the themes are the same. And, and my son, who's you know, 27, still can spend a couple hundred bucks a month or a quarter on buying something to hedge the financial risks out there in my case currency risk and he he buys little pieces of gold and silver mm -hmm. and again he's not going to make a lottery ticket win like i did not because he's any less intelligent he's far smarter than i am but it's just a different world now and so again preservation of wealth certainly when you're in a family office that should be a priority but even when you're just trying to get by you're running uphill in roller skates with your currency with your canadian dollar and you were talking earlier, you know, you, you got these capital gains taxes, you've got these global warming risks that Trudeau is using to usurp money from the people. Mm -hmm. Because every broke nation throughout history, well, they borrow from each other, then they borrow from the central banks. When that runs out, they steal from the people. That's it. And in, in your own good, for your own good, for Correct. this greater good. But it's just broke. They're just debt-soaked countries. And so when you're... You know, even when you're getting taxed in ON and there's inflation higher than reported and you're running uphill in roller skates, can you still find a little bit of way to what what is your Canadian dollar? What is your Canadian wealth? In my opinion, and I've looked at throughout history, I'd rather have my wealth measured in grams and ounces, mm -hmm. gold and silver, than in paper money, unbacked fiat money. And again, whether you're a waiter or whether you're, you know, a dot-com millionaire. You still got to think about what's my money? What's my currency? 
And so it's still a relevant conversation to all walks of life, but I don't want to talk about the problems of the wealthy. I think we should try and talk about the problems of everyday Canadians, Americans, Germans, Frenchies, Brits, South Africans, because the problem is global. Currencies are losing inherent purchasing power yeah. because their sovereign leaders are broke and in debt beyond their, 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 their means and finding ways like headless chickens to blame it on Putin, COVID, global warming, little green men from Mars, anything but the bathroom mirror, because all of the central bankers of the world, all of the leaders of the free world, the developing economy have been spending like drunken sailors money they yeah. don't have going deeper and deeper into debt, issuing more and more sovereign bonds that no one wants and debasing their currencies to pay for it. And that sadly isn't sensational. That's not just American, that's European, that's yeah. everywhere. It's certainly, you got to give someone like Javier Malay in, in Argentina credit for at least saying it out loud, what we already know. Argentina is an extreme example. Yeah. But what's unique about the leadership there is at least it's blunt. We are totally broke. Our Peronism, this big state government taking care of you was a complete lie, a complete failure. And now we have to we have to face austerity like grown men and women instead of like politicians. So in that way, I have a lot of respect. We'll see if he survives. Mm -hmm. But I think those conversations couldn't come out of Trudeau's or Biden's or yeah, anyone's mouth today because they're they, they want to get reelected. They want to spend more, bribe more and debase their currency to do so. And, you know, the only ones who get screwed are the people on the street whatever their yeah. income level. I, I don't even I don't even think in the West, or at least not in North America, that honesty to the extent that Malay is honest, or at least says that these are all problems would be well received here. Because I feel like it would distort or kind of throw out of whack a lot of illusions and egos of the Western political philosophy that, you know, the government can solve everything and we just got to keep giving it more. And eventually some some spending cycle will stick to the wall and actually solve something. Yeah, Nick, I mean, that's a really fair point. You know, it's easy, especially for someone like me who spends his time criticizing central bankers in general or Powell in particular or Greenspan or Yellen. And it's so easy. And it's really easy to make fun of politicians because they're pathologically weird profiles, <laughs> all of them, left or right. Uh, there's a few, right. very few great exceptions, but they're Amen. few and far between. But we have to blame ourselves, too, to your, to your point. We all want to hear what we want to hear. Tell us what we want to hear. Malay doesn't tell you what you want to hear. And politicians from Canada and the U.S. have tried to tell the truth and gotten nowhere electorally because there's a there's a fantasy among the people, too, to be told the good news. Tell us yeah. everything's going to be fine. Be calm. Carry on. That we're OK. That we are leading the world, especially Americans. It's hard for them to realize that they're they're at a turning point now this is not i don't recognize the america i grew up in i'm not just talking woke left right politics left right you know polarization the weaponization of the media the, the fiasco we've made of our of our system and our tribalism now and our fractured uh, society the disunited states there's evidence of that everywhere whatever your political leaning it's obvious there's a problem states like texas and tennessee and florida are are, are unofficially constructively seceding from the union they're creating their yeah. own you know red blue divide so there's no doubt whatever your views are that they're there were divided but a lot of that i think it's hard for people to realize or to accept the fact that you know we asked for this too we we drank this kool-aid they promised us this this and that and they're not looking at the shark fin beneath the surface which is dying credit markets and a, a purchasing power of your currency anywhere in the world getting weaker and the US dollar is relatively stronger than any other currency other than the Swiss franc and some others. But I say it's like being the best patient in the ICU or the, the fastest horse in the glue factory. So what, you know, it still means what you could buy tw 10 years ago with that dollar, whatever the nationhood, including the US dollar, you can't buy anything 10 years from now. It's just getting weaker. That's quantifiable and objective. And just being relatively stronger than the yen or the peso doesn't make me feel any better. I don't want to be relatively terminally ill if I'm already terminally ill. I just want to be healthy. And so I think the currency risks from the debt policies of our, from the Trudeaus and the Bidens and the Trumps and whoever, you want to fill it in the blank. Every leader has stayed in power by making promises they can't deliver unless they debase their currency and go further into debt. That's just a global problem now. Well, they always say the joke on the street is if the everyday person actually understood macroeconomics and currency risk, we probably have like a full-on war right now, but that's just not the case, right? So um, 
you know, I, I mean, look, we're, we're all feeling it. It's not, I'm not even going to hide it anymore because, you know, the harder you work, the more you make, well, guess what? They're taking more of it. So like you feel like you're getting squeezed regardless of like whatever it is that you're building. Right. So, um, you know, kind of building on the currency risk, I think the interesting thing, and I want to build on what Nick talked about kind of like East versus West. And I don't know how true this is, but there's this whole speculation and you probably know more about this than we do, but there's this whole speculation that China, Russia, and the Saudis have actually been hoarding and buying the most amount of gold to protect their currency because they've obviously seen the writing on the wall, whereas the West, to what you talked about earlier, has been, we're just going to print our way out of anything. Mm -hmm. the, the classic yeah. Alan Greenspan quote where it's just like, don't worry, the Fed can always print more money. We're, we'll, we'll solve our own issues. So ideologically, there's like, the East seems to be ahead of what the West thinks is going to solve the problem. So tell, maybe tell us like what you're seeing out there. What are the COMEX markets looking at? What are, like, tell us what you're seeing out there that kind of confirms that. Yeah, I mean, Dan, you've nailed so many really important themes. I'll, I, I do laugh, like you said, Henry Ford said, if everyone understood banking, there'd be mm -hmm. pitchforks yeah, on the street. Re revolution, if you, yeah. Yeah, if you understood how banks actually work, since we repealed Glass-Steagall, that was Larry Summers all over that. But that's a fair point. And von Mises, the great Austrian economist, mm -hmm. said, you know, look, even Hemingway said this, but von Mises, which is an Austrian economics, which you don't get at Harvard Business School or anywhere in the US or even probably Canada, they don't study mm -hmm. that because it's too embarrassing. Because basically what it says is you can't print a lot of money or create fake liquidity and debase your currency and go into debt without a hangover. In other words, you can't drink 20 martinis without a hangover. That's the simple basics of Austrian economics. And that's not even discussed or understood by most Westerners and certainly not in North America and in, in Canada and the US because it's too embarrassing. The more you understood von Mises, the more you'd understand what Henry Ford was saying, you'd be, you'd be angry. In terms of your other question, it's really about the East versus the West and the movement uh, uh, towards gold and away from the US dollar. It's extremely important. And this is the whole de-dollarization question that we can't underestimate. And let me caveat by saying I am not pro-Putin or pro-Xi. I don't mm -hmm. want to live in Shanghai or St. Petersburg. I'm very much an American patriot. I'm not saying that, that you know this is the goal I'm looking for. Although I guess Trudeau would probably rather be Xi than Trudeau. He's even said it out loud. So mm -hmm. is Klaus Schwab. But if you're truly a patriotic American or Canadian, it's not being critical of your country to, to ask why the hell is all this money going east into gold and going away from the dollar? And there's a number of reasons that the most important reason, uh, first of all, again, not pom poming or cheering Putin and Xi, but the Chinese and the Russians are many things, but they're not stupid. They're definitely not stupid. And Putin and Xi are not stupid. And they've been watching quietly for years as the U.S. in general and the West in particular have just been going deeper and deeper into debt with the fantasy that paying that debt with money mouse clicked out of a central bank is a sustainable policy that doesn't destroy your currency. Again, von Mises warns, you go into debt, you'll destroy your currency to pay that debt. Every time, without exception, and Canada and the US and the European community are no exception to that. And Xi and Putin understand Austrian economics. They do. And they know that they're playing chess while the West plays checkers each election cycle, <laughs> going deeper into debt. They've been waiting for an excuse to de-dollarize. And that doesn't happen overnight. But in Q1 of 2022, when we weaponize the world reserve currency, and again, I'm not taking a pro-Zelensky or Putin stance, just keep agnostic, regardless of our views on that war, which to me, the, the, the mainstream media completely twists. But regardless of whether you're pro or anti-Zelensky, in just the fact that we weaponize the world reserve currency, which John Maynard Keynes said never do. Robert Triffin said, don't do it. You know, we had economists coming for yeah, even Barack Obama said, don't do this. But when we weaponize the world reserve currency and froze the FX reserves of a major power like Russia, not Venezuela, not Iran, a major nuclear power with very tight relations with China. We, we we did something and we shot ourselves in the foot, the elbow, the arm and the face, because what that did is it said, OK, we can't trust the U.S. dollar. Now see what they've done with Putin. They can do that to you in Saudi Arabia. They can do that to you in China. Theoretically, whether you're a friend or foe of the U.S. dollar or the U.S. policies, now you don't trust that dollar in the same way. You don't because they can weaponize it. They can freeze it. They can do things to you. And so 
that began a very slow, not overnight process of de-dollarization. And many of us said from day one, you can't put this genie back in the bottle. The dollar is going to get weaker now. There's going to be less and less demand for our U.S. Treasury, our IOUs. People are going to find a way to de-dollarize. De -dollarize. And again, not overnight, not tomorrow, It's but it's already happening. And Xi and Putin were rubbing their hands together, coming up with new ways, along with the BRICS nations, which since 2022 now includes Saudi Arabia and the mm -hmm. UAE. Again, you've got to play. I always say I'm a wanker polo player. You In polo, you can be going 35 miles an hour on the field and then one back swing and you got to turn around. Or in Canada, Gretzky says, where do you play with the puck? Not where it's it sits, going. where it's going. And if you if you just step back, it is so obvious that 2022, the West screwed themselves because in the U.S. in particular, because now you've seen an incredible move away from the U.S. dollar, not the end of the U.S. dollar, not the end of the U.S. dollars of world reserve currency, or not even the end of the U.S. dollar supremacy. You got 45 nations now trade settling outside the mm -hmm. U.S. dollar. You've got China and Russia net settling and other BRICS countries net settling outside the U.S. dollar in gold. You've got 20 percent of the petrodollar now mm -hmm. selling 20 percent of oil sales, global oil sales outside of the U.S. dollar. It's devastating implications of the U.S. dollar. Again, we can get into the debate about whether the dollar gets stronger or weaker relatively, but it's it's less and less loved. And that's yep. never coming back. And, and, and what's interesting is not only are central bankers stacking physical gold at a thousand tons a year at record levels, they've been dumping U.S. IOUs, U.S. Treasuries net since 2014. The implications of that are immense. And the fact that of the oil global oil sales, 20 percent outside the U.S. dollar three years ago, that would have been unthinkable. Mm -hmm. and without that demand for the U.S. dollar, well, supply and demand, we learned that in high school economics, price goes down, the value goes down. But we need more U.S. dollars for other things, so they're going to debase it. The point is, whether you're looking at the oil markets or whether you're looking at BRICS settlements, it's it's a slow shift away. And I, I can't stress how important that is and how scary that is for Yellen and Biden and Powell. And that's why Yellen's in China right now. We can get into that. But, but, but they, they, even the petrodollar, the UAE and Saudi Arabia um, aren't Iraq and they aren't Libya. And we know what happened to the leaders of Iraq and Libya when they tried to sell oil outside of the U.S. dollar. Not coincidentally, they fell off the face of the earth. But Saudi Arabia isn't as afraid, and China and Russia aren't as afraid. Because mm -hmm. the, the simple fact is that even the Saudi currency is tied to the U.S. dollar. They don't want to see the dollar disappear yet. But what are they doing in the meantime? They're stacking gold. They're stacking gold far more than the World Gold Council would tell you they have. And, and that's not an exaggeration. That's, that's the chess moves. There's six, seven moves ahead of us just thinking, well, what, what's the dollar today? What's the DXY tomorrow? What's it going to be? It's a waste of time. I say it's like joking. What you're going to order on the Titanic menu when you're ignoring the iceberg? You've got to look what's going on. The more important analogy, I think, is militarily. In, in the U.S., I lived a long time in Virginia. I'm a Civil War geek. But when, when Robert E. Lee moved his army from Virginia to Maryland on his way to Pennsylvania, you don't need to be a military genius when you see all these cavalries and picket lines and cannons moving across the Potomac that there's a change coming. And you don't need to be a genius to see when you see nations dumping U.S. treasuries, stacking gold, there's a change coming. There's a battle coming. It's not a war. It's, it's a currency war. It's a shift. And again, that doesn't happen in one trading day or one trading cycle. But it's not quacky, conspiratorial thinking or, or kooky or gloom and doom to say that the dollar's hegemony is irrevocably changed since 2022. And the evidence, whether it's net settling in the BRICS outside of the U.S. dollar and gold, and whether it's the, uh, the certainly the petrodollar market, whether it's the net dumping by central banks in the east of U.S. treasuries in favor of physical gold, the evidence that the dollar, this weaponized dollar, is no longer trusted in the way it was three years ago is overwhelming, overwhelming. Yeah. And that has consequences on you guys on the street in Montreal, Quebec, Vancouver, Regina, New York, Tennessee, Texas, everywhere. And it certainly has ramifications here in Europe, too. So these are very broad themes. But once you understand the picket lines and the cavalry and the cannons coming, you got to start thinking, I, I either do I do I find higher ground? Do I load up my own musket? metaphorically how do i prepare because these things are happening in the meantime our media we're fighting about 
transgender bathrooms and we're fighting about you know silly things like who's going to get this year's academy award or you know it's it's silly distractions it's a distractions. Full distractions. you know distractions. putin putin validated like in the interview with carlson putin even talked about the whole petrol dollar talked about the whole freezing of accounts and how they're they're pushing a, the other part of the world away from that and then there's a saying in the sun tzu's art of war you know when your enemy's destroying himself don't impede the process. Let them continue that process. So in the meantime, let's keep doing what we're doing. And the thing is, a lot of people, you know, it's interesting. I still have a lot of people who are very stuck in this um, Western Wall Street bubble that they'll say, oh, the BRICS is meaningless. Uh, the dollar will remain supremacy for eternity. And I go, like, you one, you're, you're ignoring all of history. You assume that 100 years of economic history is all you have. Uh, yeah. And then the second thing is you're assuming this fixed assumption, but you're ignoring the dynamic forces that are showing you a pattern that's shifting. And then eventually when that momentum really picks up and the ball really starts rolling, you're going to be left behind and there's going to be no catching up. And that yeah. is something that I'm worried about the West because the West really seems to be the government creating this illusion. People are really stuck in that illusion. And then the moment that ball really kicks in or that effect kicks in, we're a lot of people in the West are going to be completely left behind. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, and, the expression in, in Germany or in Switzerland is Hockey come for the fall or uh, pride comes before the fall. That's the English mm -hmm. equivalent, you know, and it's um, yet yeah, plain devil's advocate to other people, including Brett Johnson, who I really respect, who have a strong dollar theory. You know, 85 percent of FX transactions are in the U.S. dollar. The major banking centers of the world still transact on the SWIFT account, which is U.S. dollar, the derivatives market, U.S. dollar, euro dollar. U.S. dollar, there's a huge straw sucking sound for that U.S. dollar, which keeps the demand. And for now, at least, there's still strong oil U.S. petrodollar demand. When we talk about those themes you're mentioning, Nick, yes, they are shifting in chess-like ways. And a lot of Americans or Westerners are still thinking checker-like timeframes, but it won't be overnight, to my Correct. point. But you know, in the meantime, markets can go higher on synthetic liquidity and, and fake U.S. dollar creation. But you're Again, your 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 portfolio may go up after taxes is getting crushed, but your portfolio may even go up. And even if you don't have losses and you have gains and you get past the hurdle of capital gains and reported inflation, which is another joke, it's an open lie. There's much <laughs> higher inflation than reported. But even you get past performance and then the inflation hurdle and you're left with some profit, that stronger portfolio return you got from a supported market still is measured in dollars that are getting weaker notwithstanding just uh you know these tax issues and these cpi bogus lies but that's the scary part and that's already happening right now that is already evident right now and that's why everyone feels poor even if they think they're getting a better return on x and frankly wages aren't keeping up with actual inflation and so that's why your generation my kids generation the first time in history they don't have the same prospects as their parents the average house is way beyond their salary and the interest rates on their mortgage is way beyond what's affordable. When I came out of college, it was like F. Scott Fitzgerald said, you could pick your future like from a menu. My kids, <laughs> educated kids, my daughter, five years at Goldman Sachs, very good salary, very prestigious job, very excellent analyst. She doesn't have the same confidence in her future I did when I was that age, man. And irregardless of the dot-com lottery ticket, my generation was so excited about it. We were coming out of the 80s, man, the 90s. There was hope. There was belief. There was trust in our leadership and our government and our laws and our media. All of that is just gone. And again, left or right, we all can probably agree on that. We just have different biases. But it's unrecognizable. And I'm the old guy in this conversation. It is very different Canada and America than the one I grew up with. Mm -hmm. Totally. And a very different Frankfurt, a very different London, a very different Paris, too. It just is. I, I, I always joke around, too, with my family. I'm like, I was actually born in the wrong decade because the music that comes out now, I'm an 80s guy. <laughs> yeah. So I really, oh, I really, I really enjoy sort of like that generation when you had Reagan kind of just controlling everything. Yeah. And that was like yeah. economic prosperity. So I get it. Uh, you mentioned yeah. you mentioned like interest rates obviously being a main concern. Um, inflation. I mean, everyone's talking about it. There's no question about that. Uh, the numbers are definitely manipulated because they just assume you're not going to eat, you're not going to have shelter, and you're not going to pay taxes. That's the inflation rate, right? <laughs> right? And then that's what, that's the metric that they use to justify, oh, yeah. we have a very strong jobs economy. Um, you were probably, I mean, you were around maybe just at the the early days of the 70s. And historically, that was always like 
that mm-hmm. crazy double or triple dip inflation. Yeah. And just based on looking back on what happened there, is that where maybe Western countries are kind of going right now? And historically, is the only solution war? Because mm-hmm. they are, there's an old saying, it's like when all else fails, they just take you to war, right? Yeah, I mean, it's really, really another great question, Dan. I mean, I think eyes will glaze over if we get into the weeds of bond yields and uh, spreads and CPI. And, and, and but we can try to do negative rates and real rates. And and but before we go there, your larger point because I do think the bond market is everything. If you understand bonds and you understand yields, definitely. Uh, and you understand real return and, and, and versus nominal return and sovereign bonds, including the U.S. tenure, which is so critical. But again, that gets kind of mathematically boring. But before we try to toe dip there, your larger point is simple, stupid, because the stupid so simple. And this goes to something not Bernanke or Yellen or Powell or Geithner said or, you know, Paul Tudor Jones or Warren Buffett. And well, this is something Ernest Hemingway said in the 1940s. And he said, um, Whenever you, you know, when you get to debt levels that we were in uh, post-war you'll, or even pre-war, you'll see what he calls um, political opportunists will always buy temporary prosperity and then give permanent ruin at the expense of the currency and permanent war. In other words, you can, you can distract and you can buy votes, buy time, or in Bernanke's case, even buy a Nobel Prize by creating money out of nowhere. And calling that a solution or a policy, which is is a fantasy, but it works for temporary prosperity by debasing the currency, as Hemingway warned, which gives you temporary prosperity, but always results in permanent ruin, which means debasement of the currency and war. And since I was born in the 70s, Vietnam onward, my country's either indirectly or directly at permanent war, and our inflation, misreported or underreported, is now obvious to everyone. So permanent war and inflation, as Hemingway warned and as von Mises warned, is the consequence of all debt soaked over their skis nations who confuse printed money with actual GDP and actual productivity and debase money with real money. And so, yes, inflation is not temporary. It's not transitory. It never was from the moment Powell said that. I wrote an article that's a it's a bold lie. It's a bold lie. And others are now saying it. And Powell's not stupid. He knows it was, but he's a politician. A central banker is a politician. He would say exactly what any of us would say if our careers required us line. to toe the line. You know, and they say Sinclair, they're independent, you know. So <laughs> come on. Upton Sinclair said it's amazing what a man will say when his salary depends on it. Yeah, exactly. And so um, you know, so Powell's transitory inflation is bogus. What what Powell needs is inflation. His war on inflation is inherently inflationary. We can get into that. He needs negative real rates. In other words, he needs inflation to be higher than the yield in the 10 year so he can inflate his way partly out of debt. Everyone knows that. But obviously, he has to optically say, I'm fighting inflation, raising rates to fight inflation. So, how does he get his cake in it too? He raises rates to fight inflation, but inflation is underreported grotesquely. We have significantly higher inflation than 3.7. And even if you go to shadow stats, it's probably closer to 12%. But even Larry Summers, again, not my favorite guy. I was at Harvard when he was the president. He had all kinds of problems there. I was not a fan of him when he was Treasury Secretary and he repealed Glass-Steagall and he deregulated derivative markets. But he's what I call an arsonist trying to be a fireman. He's created so much havoc, but now he wants to look like a fireman. And even he has admitted in a tweet a couple of weeks ago that if you look at inflation in the U.S. measured by the pre-1983 metrics that Volcker used with households in, in real estate, actual inflation in 2023 in the U.S. was at least 18%. Now, that's what we all feel. We cross the GW Bridge, go into Manhattan, go out to Jersey, go get pizza in Ann Arbor. We all feel it. But it's reported at 3.7, but the actual number is about 18%. So in this way, Powell has 18% inflation, 5% yield in the 10-year. He has negative 13% real return, which means it's a defaulting bond if you're using honest inflation. But that's how he gets to have his cake in it too. Optically, we're fighting inflation. We're raising rates. We're getting it down to 3.7. We're winning. But no, we've got really 18% inflation. We have negative real rates. We're debasing our currency to try and keep our nose above the waterline with uh, with this, you know, with this debt levels we have. So it's an absolute two-step. And as Claude, Jean-Claude Juncker said at the European Commission years ago, when the facts are this bad, 
we lie. We lie. And that sounds sensational. And I get it. But whether you're Robert Kiyosaki, me, or you know Jeremy Grantham on Wall Street, we all know that the inflation CPI scale, as is, I say, is bogus as a 42nd Street Rolex. It's a lie. But it's a political necessary lie to make it look like we're winning this war on inflation, when mm-hmm. actually we need inflation, as every debt-soaked regime throughout history has done, debased their currency, whether it was a Roman coin, whether it was a Ming dynasty, whether it was an Assignon in France in the 1780s, whether it was the 1930s Weimar or Franco's Spain or Mussolini's Italy, you debase your currency, you go to war, and you blame it on somebody else because you're in debt. And so that's where we are. I'm not saying this is Weimar Germany. I'm not saying America is that. We're the home of the world reserve currency. But we are in debt beyond our ability to repay. And so we will continue to distract the people with with, uh, inflation and war and blame that on anything else but our own political leadership. And to your point earlier, the suckers who wanted to believe this fantasy and vote for people who tell them what they want to hear, you know? It's as if illusion is the only tool by which they can keep playing this game because they don't really have any other way to do it. You know, like uh, when we had, was in 2021, I forget exactly when, when America technically went, it went to a technical recession based on its actual definition. But then they said, because employment is actually strong, we're not yeah. actually in a recession anymore. And now they had to redefine the concept of recession. And yeah. so like, I, I, like, I have a belief that we're in this, like, like, get, you know, give me your thoughts on this, but I have this idea that we're in this like stagnation, stagflation type of like cliffhanger moment where we're just going to keep going sideways. We're stuck in this like between a hard rock and a, a hard place and a rock. They don't want to raise rates too much because then there's going to cause total chaos. They don't want to lower rates for now, at least because their Keynesian metrics, you know, strong employment, government spending yeah. is still pushing the GDP. We're still yeah. good there. So for now, we're not going to lower rates until we have uh, some sort of real weakening G- uh, typical metric that they use and then the world is just going sideways together and eventually everyone's going to fall off yeah i mean you raise so many so many different points in that and they're all accurate and i'm really it's it's great to see your generation getting this at least asking these questions i'm not saying i have the the answer Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. these are the right questions i'll give you my opinion first of all yeah illusion works until it until until it, it doesn't but labor is the big illusion and inflation of the big illusion, the big lie, the, the big yeah. lie. I'll, that's my opinion. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, I call it the B, it's the BLS. It's really just the BS, the Bureau of BS. <laughs> because, and again, inflation, we could spend a whole episode on. My strong opinion based on a lot of empirical data is the inflation data is a lie. It just is. Everyone on Wall Street knows it, but they're never right, but they're always right because it's the official CPI. We use it. So we have to use it. The labor data of the BLS equally as bogus as a 42nd Street Rolex. And guys like Nick Eberstadt, who are not conspiracy theorists, have done a far better job than me outlining how that labor, so-called strong labor indicator, is also completely bogus. And again, we could spend a whole episode on that. Suffice it to say, look at Nick Eberstadt, look at the numbers. We could go on and on. But yes, that goes to your point about illusion. I think it's undeniable that that works until the evidence becomes overwhelming. The other points you were making, though, are, are kind of equally valid. The Fed is trapped. This country is trapped. The rates have got them trapped. The debt has them trapped. What can the Fed do? Well, first of all, it can lie about inflation. And, and meanwhile, it can keep raising rates and try to lower its balance sheet, QT, you know, higher for longer rates. And, and, and the only reason they're doing that is because when we are in a, like you said, they redefine the definition of recession. They basically lied about that, too. Just keep illusions going. Meanwhile, Powell is raising rates and promising to cut rates. We can talk about that and and trying to reduce the Fed's balance sheet. But all he's doing, he has only two guns or two weapons in the next recession. So he can lower rates and expand the balance sheet, print more money. But five years ago, rates were at zero and the balance sheet was over nine trillion. So he needed to do something now. He's only raising rates, not to fight inflation. So he'll have something to lower when the shit really hits the fan. (laughs) And he's, and he's, he's QT now so he can QT more. Well, again, those are illusions. Inflation is re- much higher than reported. Labor lagging indicators, much unemployment is much higher than reported. Recession, to your point, already there, in my opinion, by every indicator. So we are in a recession. We have weak labor and we have very high inflation. But right now he's still raising rates. But he, he, he is so screwed. No matter what he does, it still ends up with more inflation. If he raises rates to five, it keeps rates at five and three quarters, the cost of our own IOUs, Uncle Sam's 10-year, 
becomes unpayable. It goes way past $1 trillion in annual interest expense. The only way to pay for that is to print money out of thin air. So that debases the currency. If he lowers rates right now, that debases the currency. The currency will be sacrificed to save the system. In the meantime, they will use, to your point, illusion to say, well, at least labor is good. At least inflation is under control. And at least we're not in a recession. But at some point, labor will be obviously bad. The recession will be unignorable. And, and inflation will be undeniable. And then they'll just blame it on, well, we'll go to war. We'll blame it on something else. Okay. Or we'll do something we have. But it's not our fault. It's already there. And again, we could look at the definition of a recession. You could look at CPI. You mm -hmm. could look at labor markets. We are already in a recession. We already have double-digit inflation. And we already have high unemployment because most of the civilian labor force that the, the BLS uses to measure U6 and U3 unemployment isn't even counted. They're not even looking for jobs anymore. Millions. They're not even in the data. And I joke it's like measuring how many tall people there are in the U.S., but only using the NBA or the, you know, the basketball players to measure height. It's a skewed pool. That mm -hmm. does sound sensational. If you look into the weeds of this, like Nick Eberstadt does, and people who focus only on this or just on CPI, like um, John Williams, or just on recession, we, all, of those, all of those narratives to keep calm, carry on, are a lie. And again, that sounds extreme. But the end game, the end game will be throughout history, without exception, mm -hmm. without exception, is to debase the currency to save the system, to save the political elites, until the people no longer believe anything they say. Or we have some miraculous new leader who comes in and just tells the truth and says, we're broke. We've made huge mistakes. Central banks should not have taken over our financial systems. We should not have a centralized economy and a centralized bank, as Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson and others warned. We should know the history of the Fed. We should see what, an, what, a, what a cabal it is, what a racket it is. But that's probably very unlikely. So in the meantime, you know, the average sucker, whether they're millionaires or middle class, are going to toe the line. And you're going to lose the inherent purchasing power of the currency you measure your wealth in. I, I think, you know, there's the, the chaos we've seen, I think, the last since COVID really started. It's just it's just been everywhere. You'd have to be under a rock not to realize this. And um, I think I think within this, like we're, we're pretty optimistic, I think. Um, I think there's always opportunities like that's just how you have to operate. I mean, these things happen in cycles. I think at some point, hopefully within the next 10, 20 years, we're yeah. at a much brighter side than what it was, you know, the last three and a half years. So yeah. how, how do you position in this market for like a basic investment portfolio? Because that's yeah. what you're really good at as well. Yep. We talked about all the problems. I think we all agree here, yep. which is which is great. Like it's we're a all rabbit hole of it. It's a it's a big rabbit hole. <laughs> but but how do you how do you how do you position in this environment? Because there is opportunities to really get ahead. No quite no yep. doubt about that. No, and that's a refreshing way to kind of conclude the conversation because I am very cynical. But you're right. Every crisis, as the Chinese says, is an opportunity, right? And every and every market crisis is an opportunity. Um, and I'm not just saying go short the S and P because it's too narrow and it's led by five names that are overvalued. So just wait for the big short because that can be you can get squeezed. It's very dangerous, and even the best traders I know um, can get their get their guts kicked in trying to trying to time a short or lever a short. Um, uh, there's a few ways to answer that because again, I'm trying to talk to a wide audience. Some of them may be really sophisticated traders that are beyond me. Some may have no idea what to do and they're totally new to stocks and bonds and maybe they're deep into crypto. I don't want to just answer my view to one mm -hmm. type of investor. I want to keep this as broad as possible. And sometimes the simple is the most important way to look at this. It's what I tell my own kids. Um, it's like, I always joke a Chanel dress band just looks good. It's black. It's simple. It's good material. When you're thirsty, water really does the job. And here in France and Montreal, come on, a, a good baguette or a croissant is really satisfying. And sometimes the simple doesn't need to be arbitrage plays or net levered currency positions and, and, and oil swaps and currency swaps. For the average person, and like my kids and myself included, I still believe this. It's the same advice my father and grandfather gave me that nobody does. And it, it's going to sound such a cliche, but you know, buy low and sell high, right? Why would anyone be chasing a blow off top in the S&P, for example, led by five names that are basically making the S&P a tech ETF? The question isn't waiting to short the S&P like I shorted the NASDAQ. The question is wait for the most important force in the equity markets that no one talks about, which is mean reversion. Every market, whether it's too low or too high, reverts to its mean. 
this is something Jeremy Grantham, who's a far better portfolio manager than I ever was, a GMO, and I invested with him, has been saying for years. In other words, if you're, you know, you can be Buffett, you can track file, you can be a CTA and track trends. I tell my kids, people your age, be patient because even if they inflate these markets with artificial liquidity, at some point they're going to have to allow what Bob Mises is called constructive destruction, whether they do it by design or by default. Mm -hmm. These markets will mean revert. If you have some cash, you buy at a low. You cannot time the bottom. You'll never get it exactly right. But you'll it's like the definition in the U.S. Supreme Court. I can't tell you what pornography is. I just know when I see it. You'll be close to a bottom when markets, the S&P, Jeremy Grantham says 2,500, 3,000. I tell my kids, look, you're young. You're in your 20s. Wait for it to, Rothschild's quote, wait till blood in the streets on the market and buy. The problem is while you're waiting, because I would never chase these tops unless you have some tremendous confidence and some insider information on a specific name, you're probably going to get like most people burned. Most retail investors, I think, are the plankton for Wall Street prop moves and mm -hmm. FOMO and, and insider deals. I really, I've really, i seen that. That's my, I'm telling you, if you're an at-home guy trading, you think you got some strategy, you're probably going to get your ass kicked at some point by a, a Jim Cramer of the world and a bunch of shadow banks and a lot of hedge funds that just want to push you up so they can dump you. But if you think you can time that with your technicals, your Bollingers and your bands, fine. I wouldn't touch it. Um even the best hedge funds have a hard time doing that correctly, but they're better than retail investors. But what mm -hmm. retail investors can do, what I can do, what you can do, what your kids can do is have cash on the side. We call dry powder. So when this market does mean revert to Jeremy Grantham's point, to history's point, to every market, it's not 50 years from now. It's not 10 years from now. I don't know when it is. In my opinion, it's when net income margins on the top five names in the, in the NASDAQ or the S&P contract. As soon as they contract, like Lucent and Cisco and Microsoft did during the dot-com bubble that I was tracking to get out of my position, um, when net income margins contract on the leading names in an index, the markets will tank. If the, Fed is, if the Fed is hawkish, the markets will tank. So when markets mean revert, you buy at or near a bottom, and that's where you have your chances. If you want to be individual name selecting, great. If you want to be a CTA trend follower and you've got the skills, great. If you're truly a technic technician, you can see those signals, great. But most people who are doctors, dentists, uh, grocery men, waiters, restaurant owners don't have the time to do that. So I wait for markets to mean revert and I buy at or near a bottom. Uh, in the meantime, the cash that you have while you're waiting is getting eaten away by invisible unreported inflation every day. So that doesn't seem like the thing. So that's why I say, again, whether you're a multimillionaire buying gold from me in Switzerland, or whether you're buying silver coins and in, in, in gold coins in Montreal or Toronto, you can hedge. You don't have to buy farmland in, in you know outside of Hamilton if you don't have the money. But you can always, like my son, buy a little bit of gold, a little bit of gold. Again, sounds cliche. Precious metals to preserve your purchasing power, dry powder to get back in the markets when they mean revert. That's a broad piece of advice for all listeners. Now, and then you could get into the crypto plays or the silver plays or what size bars or what size coins or which, then you can get into the details. But again, I made money by accident, so I didn't even do it right. But I have since then always bought at bottoms. I've seen the bottoms in the stock market, whether it's the DAX in Germany or the S&P or in Canada's markets. Look at the leading names. Every sector is is the, find the leading sectors, the leading names in those sectors. And in those, and then that basket of names is always a leading name with net income, real, real profits. Like NVIDIA has real profits. You know, we did 19 billion last year, 22 was down 4 billion and 23 was up 19 billion, but those are real net incomes. You can't deny it. Just like Lucent and Cisco was during the dot-com bubble. You can't, they were bubble assets. They were overvalued, but they were good companies and they still are good companies. They're just overvalued. And eventually they're going to lose that, hegemony they have in volume and price and eventually they're going to retract they're not going to disappear and die they're going to contract and as soon as net income on the balance sheet goes from positive to negative that's when wall street starts making the shorts and that's when ctas start seeing their trend signals and that's when it goes against you you don't have to time that now i can't you can just see it when it happens that's the bugle call get ready and then they're going to fall hard unless the central banks create more fake money to pre-prop mm -hmm. them. So, but there will be a mean reversion. Jeremy Grantham, hell of a lot smarter than me. He's not the only one who sees this. I see it. All the hedge fund guys I talk to are waiting for it. Um, some are CTA guys. They're following this trend. It's great, great to be a CTA, a trend follower. Great. Your audience doesn't have time for that. 
wait for mean reversion, get in at the bottom or near a bottom, and then go long. If you're 80 years old, get the hell out of the markets. If you're 70 years old, just get out, take your profits. Sadly, in your and in my case, the capital gains are brutal. Hopefully, yeah. they're long term capital gains. But again, it depends on your age, your risk, your cynicism, your belief. But, you know, all bubbles pop. This is a bubble. It can last as long as net income lasts. But the two forces are mean reversion. And the most sadly, the most important force in equity markets is the central banks. Central banks have control. Dovish or hawkish means bullish or bearish. It's that sad. It's that sad. If they're going to talk about or promise rate cuts, everyone's getting the markets ripped just on the promise of a rate cut. And, and Powell probably will rate, rate, raise rates because the cost of his debt is too high if he keeps it this way. But he also knows that 1980, Volcker raised rates and uh, tried to cut rates too soon, and then inflation went up another 8%. So again, Powell, sadly, is the Oz behind these pathetic curtains of whether the markets go up or down. And that is in and of itself sad. But beyond Powell, look at those net incomes, those profit margins on the big names in your respective markets and wait for them to invert from positive to negative. That's when you can start. You could maybe short. That's dangerous. But that's when you'll see the signal get ready for a bottom. That's the trader in me talking to a broad audience. You know, you look at charts, they call it astrology for men. I mean, I look at charts all day, every day, and I don't like it's yeah. foolish to chase the top, but like I have friends calling me when like Nvidia is ripping, saying like, "Hey, yep. like, should I buy this?" And I'm like, "Probably not a good idea." Because <laughs> go look at the chart, and they're like, "What do you mean?" I'm like, "The chart's telling you what's happening." So yeah. I actually the mean reversion that stuck around with me since I first studied started studying yeah. technical analysis. So yeah, are there that. here? So here's a more specific little question: Are there any specific asset classes that you yourself find undervalued that somebody with patience or with a little bit of risk tolerance should consider? Yeah, again, I mean, everyone's going to say, ah, screw that guy. He's a gold executive in Zurich. Of course, he's going to say gold is undervalued. Of course, he's going to say that. And believe me, I don't think gold goes up in a straight line. I will sure. say with all sincerity, I don't work in Switzerland because I do it for the money. I have conviction. Now, you could say that's a bias. But I talk, 99% of the people who listen to me talk about gold are never going to be my client because my, my, the minimums at my company are too high. Mm -hmm. They're too high. So I'm saying this because I believe it. I'm saying I think gold is massively undervalued, even at these all time highs, because when measured against the broad money supply, it's about the same price it was in 1971. And in fact, the all time high for gold was in 1980 because in inflation adjusted dollars, that was about $3,000 gold today. So gold is only going to get stronger, not because that pet rock that gives you no yield and stares at you from the ground doing nothing, as Buffett says. And I love Buffett, but he's dead wrong, in my opinion, on gold. Could be wrong, too. I could be wrong. But gold is just in chapter one of its story, not in a straight line. But the reason gold and gold-related stocks, and we can talk about miners. I'm not a miner guy. And there's guys like Rick Rule and Ross Beatty, Rick Rule in particular, who can give you specific names far better than me. And you can go on YouTube and you can see what Rick Rule recommends because most of the junior miners are crap and they're crap management. But the reason gold will go higher isn't because gold is so special. It's because all currencies are going to get weaker because we are at unprecedented historical debt levels that history has never seen, not just in the US, but globally. We're looking at $400 trillion in global debt by 2030 with one third the income. That is a perfect setup for currency destruction and war and inflation. But gold doesn't get higher, currencies get weaker. I can think of no case where currencies, fiat currencies get stronger. Again, that is why the BRICS nations and China and Russia are playing chess and stacking physical gold and all the central banks in these are because they see this, not tomorrow, not next Friday, but they see this trend. So gold is a common sense value play. The miners, the larger and the juniors, that's you can buy the indexes like GDX. They'll probably do well. They're undervalued, but it is a cesspool of poorly managed M&A deals in the mining space. And Rick Rule, again, has forgotten more this morning than I'll ever know about miners. But I recommend if people want to try a little bit of risk, with a little bit of um, uh, true value, pick specific names in the junior miner space. Canadians understand their miners. You know, Mark Twain said it's a hole in the ground with a liar standing in front of it, but there are lottery ticket opportunities and well-managed mining operations in the gold space. But the just simple physical gold is going to go up only because currencies have nowhere to go with down. That doesn't mean a straight line. And that will make you that won't make you rich overnight. Silver could. I think silver has a real chance. But again, 
It's not for widows and orphans. It is risky. It's more volatile than physical gold. So it depends on what you're looking for. Preservation, speculation, quick return, faster return. There's no one size fits all answer other than buy low and sell high. And if you're going to buy low, look for value. I think gold is very undervalued right now. And I think it just goes up because their Canadian dollar is just, a, it, folks, it's going to get weaker and weaker, mm -hmm. especially the Canadian dollar. The Australians, again, I talked to South Africans, Australians, Kiwis, Canadians, Americans. Come on. You don't have to be a macroeconomist to see the writing on the wall here. Um, it doesn't mean buy only gold or gold related stocks. The one thing I learned in as an allocator in a family office, the three risks I always saw, and your listeners can take this home with them, is concentration risk, whether that's in Bitcoin or gold or NVIDIA. Don't have all your eggs in one basket. Timing risk, nobody can time a market. You have to look at the signals. And uh, leverage, don't use leverage. Don't go into debt to take risk. That goes across the board. And then the hopelessly simple cliche of buy low, sell high. No one does it. No one does it. They do the opposite. Saw it in Nikkei in 89, saw it in the NASDAQ in 2000, saw it in the GFC in 2008. They're buying at tops. And there was a great saying in Nikkei in, in, in Tokyo in 89. How can we get hurt if we're all crossing the street together? This herd mentality. Mm -hmm. You've got to not be in a herd. You've got to be contrained, but not contrained to be cool. Contrained to be smart. Pick where you're going to be contrained. Yes, this is the best time to be a CTA, to your point, Dan. There's a lot of money in this trend right now. And I would follow that trend until net income margins turn or, or the technical signals tweak. You know, Gold was in a classic teacup formation for a while. It consolidates and rips north. The and it mother, doesn't go in a straight line. The yeah. mother, it, it's silver too. Like if you yeah. zoom out, it's like the mother of cup and handles is like forming. So, so I mean, yeah, it's, so it's, it's, it's kind of it's kind of time there, but yeah. Sure. Again, that's you're going to say they're going to say that's ah, just a gold bug. No, it's common sense. And again, mm -hmm. not in a straight line, but I cannot think of an argument against gold. And that makes me nervous, too. It does. Mm -hmm. I say it to Egon all the time. I'm too I have too much conviction now on gold. It's too obvious. This is so much more obvious than the dot com bubbles when we got in early on lit loose or Cisco. This is so much more obvious. And yet what's gold doing for me? By the way, since the turn of this century and again, pick your windows. Gold has outperformed the total return of the S&P by 200 percent. 200, 200%. I mean, literally, I think it was four sixty six or against seven hundred and sixty. I mean, gold has massively outperformed the S&P. If you bought every, if you stayed in through every dip and, and reinvested your dividends, physical gold has outperformed the S&P in the biggest bull market I've seen, the biggest Fed tailwind I've seen. But again, that doesn't mean that everything is solved by gold. That's not what I'm saying. But even with these all time highs, and they will retract and can go up and down. The trend for me is only north because currencies have nowhere to go but debased for all the reasons we talked about earlier, politics. Yep. I think, I mean, we, we'd love to have you back on once mm -hmm, this whole, sure. uh, this whole, yeah, this whole tail, tailwind comes, comes through because no, it's, a, it's an interesting time. And that's, I think that's an understatement. The term unprecedented has been thrown around left, right, and center. But again, yeah. I really... This is just my fundamental belief. I don't think a lot of people our age, maybe even people your age as well, understand just how crazy of a time this is for the markets. Like it really yeah. is, I don't want to say biblical, but it feels that way. And yeah. we're, we're really at a tipping point right now, I, I believe personally. But um, Matt, Matthew, yeah. where, where, where can the listeners uh, find you? Uh, well, all our articles and interviews, mine and Egon's, are on uh, vg.gold or von Gold. This You can also go to goldswitzerland.com. It's all the same URL for the same thing. And obviously, everything we talk and write about is there. It's a great source of, I think, um, skeptical but objective data. Um, and we have Ronnie Sterfla, who's an Austrian mm -hmm. economist, who's an advisor, and Grant Williams is an advisor. So, you know, we think we understand this space pretty well. And to your point, be up. You don't have to be gloom and doom. There are opportunities here. I like that attitude. You know, I do. I have traded and lived through the dot com bubble and the great financial crisis. This feels more surreal because, mm -hmm. unlike 2008 or 2001, it's the problem is global. The dysfunction yeah. is global. So, this, there is a lot at stake here. But, you know, there's more to life than dollars and gold anyway. Be wide eyed, be open eyed. It sounds Pollyannish, but I mean it. I get more pleasure out of walking my dog than counting my dollars. I'm 54. I really, but I respect though, money hasn't made me happier. It makes you a little freer, but I do respect these questions. I do respect these concerns. I really 
I, I come from the middle class of the Midwest and most people I know can't get through the month without a headache or stress or, and I, I, I really do respect that, but even them, and I'm reminded every time I see them, it's all ephemeral here, you know, all of his smoke and mirrors anyway, just try to try to find opportunities financially. Cause it is better as, as what was it? Frank's not to have been rich. I've been poor, rich is better, but my, my philosophical response to all that's happened to me is, Money's not what really made me happy. It's my friends, my family, my horses, my dog, my cat, my close relationships. But yes, take your money seriously. Be ready for what's coming. Don't expect it to save you. But not being naive, not being a pawn, not being the plankton, whether that's being drafted into a war you shouldn't be in or being taxed when you shouldn't be taxed or lied to when you shouldn't be lied to. There's power in just having information. I'd rather have my education than my balance sheet any day. I'd rather have my freedom of thought than my freedom of, an, of a 401k. I, I made a note here. The next time we bring you on, we're going to talk about junior minors because that'll okay. be, we'll, we'll see how those developments are. Yeah, we do have a whole list winners, for but sure. I, I think Rick Rule has some good names. I would. I don't invest mm-hmm. in mining. I, I'm done speculating. But that's because I'm a coward. But <laughs> um, if you want, the, there's definitely um, places where he can give better guidance or Ross mm-hmm. Beatty or others that really know this or for Frank sure. Justra. These, these guys really know this space. Mm-hmm. Matthew, thanks so much for coming on. Um, it's been a wealth of wisdom as well. And it's it's good to obviously share ideas and kind of it's great. It's great to have a, a common world view as to what's happening because <laughs> it's rare to find these days. We'll call it the contrarian of the contrarians, right? So yeah, I guess uh, it's good. <laughs> you guys inspire me to know that there's people who are asking and thinking about real things because it's far more important than your TikTok account right now. Of course. I, we don't even have TikTok. Yeah, exactly. So there you go. <laughs> good. Thank God. That gives me faith. It gives me faith. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks so much for listening. And we'll see you next time on the New Gen Mindset Podcast. Ciao, guys. Take care.